I want to talk briefly today about um, a couple of things, um, the CRISPR-Cas9 system and gene drive. Can you put these up on the screen? Uh, I um, apologize. Normally, I speak with slides the same way Dr. Novak does, but um, Manuel told me that he wasn't going to let me do that today. So Now, CRISPR-Cas9 and drive, I'm putting up here gene drives just to show you that the um, phrases so that if you're interested in this, you can look up further information on the net later on. And can you give me one more? Okay, well, we'll work without the slide. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm showing you this because I want to um, show you that a CRISPR is not an actual word itself, but just an acronym. And I'm not going to repeat all the different uh, things. I have to put it up on the slide like this so that I remember it. Um, and I hasten to, um, to assure you there'll be no quiz at the end of this on these things. So what is CRISPR and what is gene drive? So um, about 25 years ago, um, scientists found in single-celled organisms, bacteria, a, uh, a kind of, if you will, an immune system uh, to protect them from bacteriophages, viruses which actually invade bacteria. When viruses invade a bacterium, they inject their um, DNA through the cell wall into the bacterium. That DNA takes over the bacteria the cell's bacterium, and causes production of more virus particles. Well, it turns out this mysterious um, uh, thing, which was not called uh, CRISPR until, I believe, about 2005, uh, when it encounters viral DNA, it cuts these viral DNA strands up, thereby protecting the uh, bacterium. So in 2012, um, Dr. Uh, Jennifer uh, Doudna, who, uh, whose lab is actually just down the road at the University of California, Berkeley, um, found that she could use this same system to actually purify and alter a DNA outside a bacterium. So what is this system? Well, it consists of two things. First of all, a nuclease or a, uh, an enzyme that, that cuts biologically um, and a, what's called a guide RNA that takes these molecular scissors and guides them to the place where a cut is needed. Well, it turns out that you can design the system so that you can... Uh, take a cell and use the molecular scissors, if you will, to cut out a piece of DNA and with the guide RNA, uh, the guide RNA provides a template for the cell itself um, to replicate the part of the guide in RNA and produce DNA. So, in other words, you can you can get into a cell, and you can actually alter the DNA of the cell. Um, now, what's this being used for? Well, uh, it's, it's actually... So, first of all, let me step back and say scientists have known it's possible to alter a DNA for a long period of time, but it, it was very difficult. This use of this particular... Um, technique is actually very quick and the cuts made and the replication of the new DNA is actually very precise. And so it's, it's assumed a number of really um, key roles very quickly. Uh, first of all, it enables the construction of what are called knockout mice in weeks or months instead of years. Knockout mice are important in cancer research and other research because what they involve is an animal, mostly a mouse, uh, where a particular gene's function has been knocked out. 
so that it gives a very precise, uh, if you will, animal model in which you can investigate the um, uh, the particular course of a, a disease, for instance, cancer, in the absence of a particular um, gene. Um, it's also found a use in um, what what is called personal uh, medicine, and that is that you can uh, extract cancer cells from individuals with cancer and use this um, CRISPR system to um, to uh, actually take each mutation in the DNA that characterizes the malignancy and test what the function of this mutation is so that you can try and pick out, if you will, the Achilles heel um, of the cancer so that we can move towards real personalized cancer treatment based on the individual um, mutations within uh, a person's individual cancer. Okay, gene drives. What are gene drives? Well, um, a gene drive is basically a technique for increasing the prevalence of a particular um, characteristic or gene in a population. And in a gene drive like this, um, it, it, with, a, with the CRISPR uh, um, technique, what you incorporate is in, into, and, and I would emphasize that gene drives work only in sexually reproducing uh, species. So um, let's, let's use a, an example of mosquitoes and malaria. Um, what the CRISPR system enables you to do, um, actually, with, um, say, uh, a species of mosquito which uh, carries, um, uh, say, malaria, is to modify uh, the germline DNA of the mosquito, uh, a few thousand of these mosquitoes, by incorporating into the DNA both these molecular scissors and, say, a gene um, which confers resistance to malaria on this mosquito. Now, you recall that in sexually reproducing spe uh, species, every cell has two strands of DNA, and in the offspring, when um, mosquitoes mate, the offspring get one strand from each of the male and the female. So if you've altered either the male or the female using this uh, CRISPR gene drive, what happens is because you've incorporated all this material into that DNA, it picks up that the DNA from the wild-type mosquito requires the clipping and modification of the gene to the same pattern uh, as your modified mosquito. And so what happens is that as progressively your uh, core of mosquitoes, your, if you will, offspring of, of uh, the modified mosquitoes increases, eventually um, this, uh, this drive, this incorporation of the particular mutation within the mosquitoes drives its way through the whole population. And if you could, can you move the next... So in normal Mendelian inheritance, okay, with no gene drive or anything, the maximum you would expect to see over several generations of mosquitoes would be 50-50, um, okay? 50% 50 of the, the offspring without, without, will, be, will have a particular gene of interest, 50% won't. In, with gene drive, if, if you incorporate it um, early on with each coupling, it transmits to all the offspring the modified gene. So then in the end, you end up with 
um, a type of mosquito which no longer can carry um, the malaria uh, parasite. So uh, other uh, attempts or other um, ways that you might use a system like this would be um, to insert something in the germline DNA, say, of mo a mosquito with female that uh, causes them to lay only infertile or sterile eggs, which would result in the extinction of that mosquito um, species. So um, we're left with something, and, and I would emphasize that um, gene drives with um, mosquitoes are in the process of being tried in the laboratory. Uh, um, scientists have got together and determined that to the present time, none of the CRISPR modifications should ever be used in humans, um, and the gene drives should be experimented with only in the lab. Now, it, it, the, the thing is this. Um, we have a technology here which actually could, at least in theory and probably in practice, uh, eliminate a huge um, extent of human suffering. There are something like four to 500,000 deaths from malaria a year all around the world and over two million new infections. And many of the deaths occur in very young children under the age of five. On the other hand, there are all sorts of concerns about a gene drive itself. Um, what happens if the, the mutation that you're trying to incorporate gets incorporated at the wrong place? Because the guide RNA in CRISPR only requires about 18 or 19 of the bases to match up. So in theory, it could actually cause mutations in other parts of, of a mosquito. Uh, now, um, the other issues are that if you choose to try and eliminate a mosquito uh, species, um, what effect does that have on the environment? Um, what are the downstream effects of this? Um, what's, what's the downstream effect of the loss of biodiversity, in other words? And also there are potential biosecurity issues. This is not like constructing an atomic bomb. Um, this work can be done with competent graduate students for a few thousand dollars in a, a minimal laboratory setting. So there are potential real biosecurity issues here. Now, I mentioned that both gene drives and uh, the CRISPR system are largely related or, or confined to the lab at the present time. However, um, there are strong um, currents wishing to use this for, for greater good. But with the, the biosecurity and other issues, we've got um, a conundrum here. I mean, everybody acknowledges that current national and international regulations regarding handling of biologics are inadequate for this. Uh, who should control this? How should it be controlled? Um, how, how do we incorporate into use of this the people who are going to be directly affected in this? Uh, I mean, if, if you, if, if you're a North American, you might say none of this should be used at all. Um, because we shouldn't be interfering with the environment in this way. But if you're an African woman whose child has just died of, um, malaria and you're pregnant with another child, you're going to have an entirely different viewpoint. So there's a lot of um, disputing about this at the present time. And we recognize that popes from John 23rd, uh, Paul VI, uh, John Paul II, all express concerns in their encyclicals and letters um, about our lack of realization of the interconnectedness of um, species. Um, 
and Pope Francis, as previous um, folks have said, have noted in Laudato Si, our common home, um, that we really need to take care of uh, not only the environment, but every creature in it. I, in, in fact, I mean, it was funny as I was reading Laudato Si, he was kind of channeling, um, Francis was channeling um, uh, St. Francis, and uh, St. Francis's notion that uh, each and every creature is united to him by bonds of affection. And I was thinking to himself, he, he couldn't have been thinking that with, surrounded by a cloud of mosquitoes. But <laughs> anyway, um, the, the, the issue, the, the problem here is that already these techniques are leading to um, the, the problem of pressure groups building up on each side. And pressure groups, as, as we know, don't talk to each other. They talk within themselves. What, and what is really um, needed here is really open, constructive dialogue, um, which, which I've heard over and over again today, and which is historically a strong point of uh, the Dominicans. So um, to bring the whole thing to a conclusion, I, I want to stop there and um, make apologies to any card-carrying geneticists in the audience. I'm an epidemiologist, and what do I know about genetics? And and sort of close to with finally by, uh, by uh, perhaps paraphrasing my... Um, my friend Ron Austin's phrase, uh, uh, what are we going to do with this scientific whammo? Thank you. Thank you.